this um, opportunity, it's a privilege, uh, to, to be able to make this connection with band directors and subsequently uh, young musicians, because it, it's a passion of mine. But also, I think that guys and, and, and ladies in my particular genre are, um, are very well suited um, to kind of make that entry point um, for these kids, because uh, for a few reasons. But first of all, the fact that this music already has elements in it. But let me start by saying, okay, we're going to call it jazz, but we know that that word is a, it's a very big word. You know, everything from Brazilian to the blues oriented, you know, to, you know, Coltrane to the Chicago Art Ensemble. It's, it's huge. It, to Candy Dolfer, to Kenny G, it's, it's, it's big. But for us, the elements that really kind of narrow down uh, what it is that we do have everything to do with urban music, with R&B, hip hop, the music that kids are tuned into. They're already turned in, tuned into that music. Though there are elements in our music that directly correlate with that. So right away, you've got a way to get them excited about it. And as you know, learning is about getting kids excited about the subject. You know, the minute you come at them with, this is something that you quote unquote need to know, uh, right away you're going to lose their attention. But if you've got a way to get them passionate about it, then they will learn faster and they'll, they'll learn better and they'll learn for a longer time. So for us to, to, to offer this music and this connection that is, is a natural with this music that's, you know, they call it smooth jazz, they call it R&B, soul jazz, or whatever. I'm from Memphis, it's a natural for me. It's, this is where I grew up, you know, playing in gospel music and playing rhythm and blues. So those elements, along again with the street music, the urban music, they're naturally a part of what we do. In the meantime, I'm at home working on tone. I'm at home working on Joe Henderson. I'm at home working on the Slonimsky, Slonimsky exercise. It's hard to even say, let alone play them. Um, you know, and I'm at home working on scale and, and, and patterns and and you know interval exercises and just you know all kinds of crazy stuff. So and Coltrane, moments notice and giant steps and all and on and on. So I'm able to kind of be a bridge for uh, I seeing I we are able to be a bridge for these kids. And I think that's an underused resource. I think a lot of times band directors go right for the guys that they admire and respect. Okay, which I understand. They go right for the technical geniuses of this genre. And they get these guys in and, and ladies in, and they da they're dazzling, of course. But see, the thing is that you've got to consider what is going to get that kid you know, passionate right away. What can, catch, um, what, what can catch their imagination right away? And that's, that is, again, something that they already are tuned into. So that, again, that's why I feel excited about uh, you know, perhaps reintroducing a resource that I think is underused, and that is this music that's R&B jazz, it's soul jazz, it's urban hip-hop jazz. It's a way to get kids excited. I like, I like the point you made about <clears throat> getting them excited, because once they're excited, once they lock in mm -hmm. the scales and, the, and, and, and all, all of the you know, arpeggios and all the interval, yeah. all that work yeah. will come because they love what they're doing and they got that spark. Exactly. You but know? you got to get them on board. Sometimes you do it the other way around. You turn them off because then it seems like work and they don't get to enjoy that spark. Well, the, you know, sometimes it can seem to them like their math class, you know, or, right. or like their, you know, their biology class. They're like, well, dang, you know, this is a boomer. You know, it, well, yeah, there's aspects of it that are very rudimental and they are kind of a drag, mm -hmm. you know, but, but you don't mind doing them when you have some motivation. For me, for instance, I had an uncle who was a jazz pianist who, who played um, with James Moody and uh, lived in New York. And when he found out I was playing, he, he came, he, he was in Memphis, so he came out of the house. And the first thing he hands me is John Coltrane Giant Steps. Okay, I'm 13. <laughs> and so, you know, I listened to it and once, and that was it. It went over my head. It wasn't until 10 years later almost that I really got into that music. But what I got into was the music that was on the radio. I was into the Jackson 5 and the Bar Kays and again, growing up in Memphis and you know, all, all of that music, Shaka Khan and Rufus. And, and so ultimately, when I heard Grover Washington and when I heard Stanley Turrentine and Ronnie Laws and David Sanborn, now I'm hearing something that, wait a minute, this kind of sounds like the music on the radio. 
Okay, but ultimately, I got back to the hard stuff. I got back to the dense stuff, you know, the cold train and the scale exercise and the long tones. And it was by then, now I'm in college and I've got a classical instructor going, you will play long tones, <laughs> you know. And I competed. You know, when you start competing, that's another thing. Once you get them on board, you get them excited, then you put them in an environment where they're competing. You know, you're all city band, you're all state band. And they're going to do the work because they're, here's the next guy, the next lady over here, sounding great and practicing, you know, doing the work. So they're inspired to do it. So, again, I think it's important to have that centralized thing, some kind of way to get them motivated. And that's the way, that's why we like doing clinics and coming in because we're going to play something that has a groove to it and we'll catch their imagination. But if they stay with us, we're going to point them where you're trying to point them, and that is, and in, in we want you to have solid technique. My primary influences, um, starting out in Memphis, really playing in church, uh, were gospel singers, and um, you know I think there's a there's a there's an aspect of my playing that even to this day uh, is is really connected with that passionate um, delivery uh, of the message. You know, uh, gospel singers don't just sing for their health. They don't just sing because they want to be rich. Gospel singers are singing for God. So, so there's a connection, there's a passion there with every single note that, that grabs people. And that's the kind of thing I think that is, again, it's another thing that's not taught very well because they're approaching it more from a technical point of view. Well, this is how you get a good sound, and this is how you, you know, good, you know, finger positions, whatever. But nobody's teaching them, listen, what do you what do you like? What do you love? Is there something that you're passionate about? You know, again, if you're a Christian, then that's easy. You know, we, I love God. So, you know, for me, that was where I, that was my entry point. But it's still with me today that when I perform, when I play the melody, I'm not just playing it. I'm delivering a message. It's something that's from deep within. Every single kid has that. Again, it may not be, you may not be Christian. You may not be religious at all. But there's something in you that God gave you that is a passion, something that makes you tick. Uh, it may be comic books, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's something that you can reach down and identify and deliver that through the music, through the melody. And that's what's lacking. That's what really makes people fans for life. When they hear that something and they connect with it, they're with you. And if you can teach that to kids early on, they can start being productive earlier. Um, so my primary influences were gospel singers. Then I went on and listened to a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the Grover Washingtons and Hank Crawfords and the saxophone players who, they were more in the milieu of uh, kind of R&B or soul uh, instrumental music. And jazz, you know, it was, it was Cannonball Adderley with, you know, uh, Mercy Mercy. And so it was things, it, they, they were um, accessible to me. Uh, because again, I didn't have much of a, uh, of a knowledge of jazz history, and I didn't really know Coltrane from Joe Henderson from whomever. Okay, and the same thing with these kids. You have to find something that they can relate to. Then you lead them on this journey. Um, so my my influences started to change as I matured. Um, of course, I listened to James Moody a lot, and Sonny Stitt, and Sonny Rollins. Um, you know, uh, eventually, right now I'm, in, I'm into Joe Henderson, and, and that's funny because I, you know, all through college I was never really into him, but now I just like, just discovered him, like it just, it just arrived, you know, so I practice Joe Henderson stuff all the time. What methods would you suggest a student use, or what could they do to develop their own personal sound? I think sound is, is like a voice, um, again, primarily for wind instruments, but even with guitar and keyboards and, you know, sound is really your voice, that's your identity. And Dave Sanborn told me years ago, he said, sound is everything. And, um, you know, the other stuff you're working on all along, but, but you've got to pay dues every day uh, towards your sound. And of course, the primary way we teach that uh, is long tones, you know, long tones and practicing and focusing in on vibrato, um, really, you know, opening the throat and, um, you know, supporting from the diaphragm, just all the all this, the stuff that kids are already, you know, being taught. I'm, I'm certainly not bringing anything new, but it's about um, paying dues towards a, a, a beautiful sound uh, by virtue of these tried and true methods, long tones, etc. 
Um, from there, I always, uh, you know, try to teach kids to again to, to to learn how to sing melodies. You know, you, you know, I think that's another thing that that isn't stressed enough. You know, you need to be a singer. Every musician should be able to sing. And again, that's not to say that you're going to be a Whitney Houston, but you should be able to sing that thing you're trying to to play. Get it in your head. Get it in your heart. Sing it to yourself, and then reproduce that on the instrument. It's got to connect with people. It's, music is a language, you know. People talk about music is the universal language. That's true. And it's true because it's supposed to communicate something. That's what language does. If you're just playing a bunch of notes, I don't care how technically uh, uh, developed you are, it's a, it doesn't really count. It's, you got to connect. And that is about being passionate about what you're playing. It's about connecting in such a way. It's almost like you're condescending, you're humbling yourself to submitting yourself to the melody. You want to you want to bless people with this melody. So you got to you got to be communicating through it. And again, these are things that kids can understand. You know, you say, "Well, that's that's kind of, you know, ethereal and idealistic." No, they can get that. You have to make sure they understand that it's a language. I speak French. I'm working on Spanish. I speak a little Japanese. It's, it's music is the language that everybody speaks. We can go and play, I'll be in Indonesia in about a month, and I guarantee you I'll connect with them because I'm playing a language they can understand. And so that is a concept that kids have to get their head around, that this is not just you holding a horn playing a bunch of notes. You are communicating something. A, what are you saying? And B, do you mean it? You know, people, people will be able to tell. One, what separates one kid from another is like, wow, that kid was kind of convinced me, you know, and I think that's what, uh, that, that's a concept that, that will revolutionize the, the way they play. Staying with the concept of sound, mm -hmm. how important is um, your reed, mouthpiece, ligature, that combination, how, right. how does that play a part? Here's the thing, a, a com the company I'm with is Van Dorn, and that's not because I went around searching, you know, hey, let me find a company that's going to give me a bunch of money or, 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 you know, give me a bunch of product. It was literally for me because you know I make plenty of money, so I, I can I can buy my own stuff. I like I like to identify the stuff that, and this is my term, that gets out of my way. Okay, so now I'm playing long tones for thirty something years now. I'm you know I, I'm developing this sound. I'm working hard at focusing the tone and all that, opening the throat, diaphragm, blah blah blah. I don't need a mouthpiece and a reed and a ligature that's in my way, that's impeding the sound that I work so hard to produce. And that's what I found in the Van Doren reeds, the V16, I, I, I pick one out of the box, I wet it, I put it on the instrument. It's that simple. And see, for me, um, that, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm a simple guy, I really don't want to. I have a friend whose name is Dave Sanborn <laughs> who goes through a hundred reeds trying to find two that play, you know. And I so admire him. I'm like, man, I don't have the patience for that, you know. And he's whittling here and whittling there. I'm like, I want to find a reed. I can pick it up, put it on the instrument, and it plays great. Okay, you might find one in every ten that's not quite what you need, but you keep going. I have the mouthpiece, the V16 mouthpiece, and the reeds, and the ligature, because they stay out of my way. And that's what it's got to be. Your voice has got to be unimpeded. And you pay whatever you need to pay to have that. And fortunately, again, I played a lot of really expensive kind of designer mouthpieces, a couple with my name on them. But I got to this mouthpiece that's less than $100, and it did everything I needed, and that was it. I was like, great, because I don't want to think about that. I have other things I'm working on, or I've got my business, you know, and each, every musician is, is an entrepreneur. You know, we're, we're self-employed, so there's a lot of other things you got to be doing. I don't have time to be sitting there messing around with reeds and mouthpieces. So the V16 reeds mouthpiece ligature stays out of my way. Can you think way back, what made you decide to be a professional musician? Right, I, I think... And I say way back because right. you've been <laughs> in the business a while, long time. Yeah. I think probably, you know, deciding to become a, a professional musician is, is something that I never experienced. Um, uh, I think that those of us who are meant to do this, uh, it's a calling. 
it's like you it chooses you you don't necessarily choose it um, I, I can identify times in my journey where I realize okay this is this is serious you know uh, for one reason or another you got to step it up and that kind of thing but as far as choosing it no I when I was you know eight or nine years old I already had visions of of grandeur you know <laughs> of uh, of being a famous musician one day, you know, but but it wasn't so much that as I want. I wanted to be really good at it, you know. I wanted to be good at playing the saxophone. How important do you think it is for music education in the lives of young kids today? And how important was it for you? Um, music education can be anything from uh, a really cool something to have in your life. Uh, all the way to a lifeline, you know, like uh, there are people who will tell you that music saved their lives, you know, the music education was that something, just like a lot of athletes and people say that that was the thing that uh, made the difference for them. And, um, you know, music education, of course, um, you know, we're in a, a new era right now, I, I think starting at the beginning of this year, where I believe that we're going to see a lot more um, emphasis placed on um, uh, really, I guess, putting the substance back in into a lot of these programs, these arts programs, uh, and the connection between art and the rest of life, you know, the connection between music and, and, and everything that, uh, that has to do with human beings, you know. Um, I sincerely hope and again I use that word you know this is this is the age of hope you know we've got we've got a, a chance now I think to see a lot of things change um, and I really hope that the, that the music education of my childhood where uh, it was it, it, it was everybody was involved it was a community thing you know that's what I'm hoping that we can get back to because it's one thing that once they took it away um, you go back and you do the you do the uh, research, and there was a 20, 30 years uh, of you know a lot of kids having to find other things to do, you know, and that's not a good thing, you know, a lot of all that idle time. So I, you know, in in many ways, I think music education is a lifeline, and I think people have cut that lifeline. Well-meaning people thinking, well, you know, well, our test scores aren't lining up with Japan or whatever. I'm like, you know, part of that is because you cut the music out. And music is something that really does help to tile those things together in the kid's life. You give that child something that is that they're passionate about, that they God didn't stop making kids who are passionate about music. <laughs> you know, it's still it's still okay, just like when I was a kid. So you identify that thing and you tap into it, that's gonna be your anchor. And that'll take care of your science and your math and everything else if you got the kid passionate about learning. But if they're just learning because the test scores don't line up with Japan. I'm sorry, that's going to fade, you know, and they'll get bored or distracted. But music is something, it's, su it's such a jealous lover. Like, music's like, I want all your time. I'll give you just enough to do your homework, you know, but I want all the rest of your time. And that's a good thing. Looking back, what would you uh, consider your first big break? I always talk about my big break uh, as something that happened in a very small way. You know, life is full of paradoxes. And, and for me, um, there's a scripture that says if you're faithful in the small things, that God will basically make you uh, the administrator or steward of bigger things. And that's what happened with me. Um, I was playing with my band. We, you know, I don't know if it was, you know, arrogance or ego or whatever. We thought, man, we, you know, we're it, man. We're, we're, you know, we're not kidding. You know, we're not taking any prisoners. We, we made sure our show was, was top notch. We worked hard on our stuff. And we were there every night at this little club in Houston. Uh, I was in college. And uh, we were trying to, uh, you know, like I said, take no prisoners, man. And, and it just so happens that in that small environment uh, is where my break happened. But it wasn't because I was out networking. I wasn't passing out cards. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't wasting time networking. I was focused on the little thing, okay, but trying to do it in a big way. And sure enough, uh, Bob James uh, heard me in that context. Uh, he happened to be in town uh, playing a concert. 
and uh, we were we were asked to open this concert, and he heard us at Soundcheck. Basically, that Soundcheck changed my said changed my life, you know, because next thing I knew, I got got a call from his manager in New York, and Bob was working on a record, and uh, do you think you'd come to New York and, and play on Bob James' record? I'm like, yeah, I think I can work that out, you know, and um, recorded one of my songs, song I wrote for my wife, and uh, the rest is history. I really can't just a blur. I mean, at that point now, I'm touring with him, I'm in Japan, I'm in Hawaii, I'm touring all over the states, we're in DC, we're in New York, we're in LA, and um, so my break definitely was not something I contrived or, 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 you know, orchestrated by virtue of, you know, networking, it was me being faithful in the small thing, and I think that's a good concept for kids to know because it's overwhelming to think, wow, I got a network and uh, Facebook and, uh, you know, all that's nice. But how about you practice your instrument and be faithful in this? If you've got this recital or you've got this band gig or whatever, how about being faithful in that because you're going to look around and that's going to be your break. But it's always going to take you by surprise. The question is not you, you know, whether or not you're going to get a break. Is are you going to be ready when the break happens? Where do you see your career in the future? Do you look... <clears throat> look to the future, or are you living in the moment? Right, yeah. I think jazz musicians have a, a way of, of living in the moment, you know, because the moment in, it, in our world is a, is, is a chance to improvise, you know. It's sort of, it is a forward-looking moment. But that can, be, uh, that can be bad, too, because, you know, we, we don't tend to plan as, much, as well as we should. But... Um, I love what I do. Um, I'm actually in school now, I'm working on a master's uh, in religion. And uh, so a lot of what I do is, is in that world. And we play at a little club in Japan a lot that's, uh, it's called the Kickback Cafe. And they can find it online, but it's, it's, a, it's a performance venue. And through, through the week, and, you know, on Saturday night, you're out there playing. And then on Sunday morning, it's a church. So I go and I play and, you know, do my thing, improvising, you know, Saturday night, Friday, whatever. Sunday morning, I preach a sermon and play. So that's the kind of thing I love doing, and um, you know, sharing God's love and, and, and you know through what I do. But I have a love for kids, you know. So I'm involved right now. I'm artist in residence at a place called the Stax Music Academy, S T A X. And Stax Records, of course, was you know a lot of the band directors will know you know Otis Redding and you know all us old timers will you know Otis Redding, the Bar K's, you know. Uh, Sam and Dave, all that great music, Isaac Hayes, all that came out of Stax in Memphis, S-T-A-X, and that, now it's a museum, the Stax Museum of American Soul Music, and there's a Stax Academy, and uh, I'm artist in residence there, so I have a direct uh, involvement with kids um, uh, on a sort of weekly basis, depends on my schedule. I love it, and that's, so my future will, will have a lot more of that, um, a lot more, you know, doing clinics, you know, Still traveling uh, and uh, trying to make that connection with kids. Your latest project. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on what we should check out? Absolutely. KirkWhalem.com. K I R K W H A L U M. KirkWhalem.com. We've got a place called The Basement where the musicians hang out. So you click through there and there's a spot in there that, uh, you know, you have instructional videos and, and just sort of helpful hints and that kind of thing. Um, we also have a, a, a clip from our brand new project, which is called The Gospel According to Jazz, Chapter 3. And uh, there's, it's, a, it's a live DVD featuring some great musicians like George Duke, Layla Hathaway, Doc Powell on guitar. Uh, my uncle, who's, the, you know, I seldom mention him as my primary mentor because I don't want people to think, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, whatever, your family. No, actually, my uncle is an amazing saxophone player, and he's the one the first real saxophone player I ever heard. Um, so he's featured on this new DVD and CD, it's a double CD, as well as my nephew, who's 25, really incredible saxophone player, his name is Kenneth Whalen the third. He's out touring with Jay-Z and a lot of hip-hop artists. He's played with, with Beyonce and, and touring. Right now he's, no, he's back from Paris, just back from Paris, like a day, two days. Um, touring uh, with a lot of you know great hip hop artists. So here I'm sandwiched between on this new project, my 80 year old uncle playing sax, my 25 year old nephew, 
you know. And so that's something I'm really excited about, like three generations of tennis players, you know, just going after each other. Of course, Don Marco always wins, but, <laughs> you know, he's like, he knows the tricks. You know, it's like wrestling with your dad. You know, you might be stronger, but he sort of has a way of, you know, uh, getting you. But, but that's exciting. Um, we also have a new record called Round Trip. That one's about a year or a year or so old. Uh, Round Trip is, um, you know, about going back to when I first started out making records in 84. And uh, so we go back and redo some of those songs. And then we go, you know, go ahead and in the present, we do some sort of spoken word things. And in and, and the future, we got some, some rap in there and just some really cool things, that, again, that the kids will identify with. But it's done in such a way where there's, there's elements in there where they'll, they'll have to sort of do their homework, you know, to say, hey, wait a minute, didn't, didn't he just play like a, you know, augmented, uh, diminished, uh, flipped around <laughs> something, you know. So we try to keep them guessing. Well, Kirk, on behalf of Van Dorn and BandDirector.com, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. So thank you. That's my pleasure.